quadcopters are dominating both film sets and battlefields simultaneously, but it's a little bit unexpected to see how it is being done. It's not the super fancy flying robots that are winning, but the dirt cheap high speed FPV drones that are taking over. But FPV drones were not born on the battlefield. Originally, uh, it was kind of a racing thing. And then as they got more uh, effective and capable at carrying weight, carrying bigger and better cameras and GoPros got better, they got used a lot more for cinematography and uh, social media stuff. Now we started this series talking about lessons that we have learned from the battlefields of Ukraine. And we didn't really get into that quite as much with some of the commercial or civilian drones we've talked about in the past. DJI drones got a lot of use in Ukraine. Uh, some of the alternatives, not so much, but what we're seeing more of and I would say more and more all the time, is little, tiny, disposable, uh, kamikaze FPV drones being used on the battlefield. And this is something that we see developing over time, I think for a couple of different reasons. Uh, when the war first broke out, there was a lot of DJI stuff that was getting used, partly because there was an invasion and people responded using the stuff that they already had, the stuff that they were already familiar with, the stuff that they already had the ability to order and just made sense. And then as things went on, they got a huge amount of money and material from the United States and some NATO countries. And you get to see more and more of the military industrial complex kind of drones being used by Ukraine. And you also see Russia using their equivalents. But as this three day war has dragged on for a bit longer than three days now, you start to see more and more FPV stuff getting used. Partly because people are starting to run out of that stuff, but partly because these actually have a tremendous amount of untapped effectiveness that is just now starting to be tapped. Earlier this year, we invited our friend Eric Hellinger out to the T-Rex range to shoot some video with his FPV drones and talk to him about his process in creating these cinemagraphical images. What are they called? Moving images? Moving pictures? I can't remember anymore. Uh, Instagram reels, I think that's what they are. TikToks. Uh, but we also made a YouTube video, which you can watch, I'll link to it down below. But he showed us a whole bunch of really interesting things that he was doing with his setup. And we got a radio. Controller, it's technically called a radio, right? Uh, eight channels on here, um, you know, and this binds to the receivers that are in each of these drones, and that gives me my control. We got your goggles, uh, essentially they're VR goggles, uh, which bind to the video receiver, which enables me to see where the drone's going, obviously. Uh, and I see out of this camera, which binds to the goggles. And then, uh, aside from that, that's kind of like an overview of the drones and we have this field charging setup, charging some batteries right now, charging this radio right now, uh, which is usually pretty common for being out on a film set like this, just because a lot of these FPV batteries only last five minutes tops, you know, so. And that's, and that's because the power to weight ratio on these is. It's like seven to one. Yeah, yeah thrust to weight ratio, yeah. So, uh, or at least on this one it is. This one's, these ones, the ducted ones are a little bit lower, less agile. Uh, so yeah, doing some field charging. And cool part about all of this stuff for a shoot like this is they all fit in, pretty much all of this just fits in a backpack. That power to weight ratio and the small size means that these things get up to really good speeds and they have a huge amount of maneuverability to them, which means that a good pilot can do all kinds of crazy stuff. That crazy stuff works really well on a film set or a shooting range or uh, the two-way shooting range that is a big chunk of Ukraine right now. It's gonna be very hard to shoot down a drone moving that fast, I would think, with, a, with like a rifle or small arms fire something like that. So there, so being able to avoid, you know, um, contact there with the drone is, is a pretty big advantage. Uh, and even, even going that fast, it, it's still very precise. You know, like we could still fly through a window at 70 miles an hour or, you know, get close to a radio tower at that speed or something like that. You know, even with a full, you know, squad, you know, kind of deterring us. 
We showed a clip from uh, some wannabe Spider-Man movie back in uh, the first episode showing little tiny drones chasing down a guy on a motorcycle. We tried to recreate that with the Skydio, uh, but you actually see this happening in real life with real FPV drones and real lethal results uh, in Eastern Europe right now. I would say battlefield applications are sh shockingly similar to cinematography, how we use cinematography drones and things like that, and because we're usually chasing a subject or an actor or something like that, or a car or a motorcycle, things like that, you know, so at high speeds. So there's a question, which is why would you pick such an incredibly bare bones airframe to do some of these particular jobs when uh, other types of drones are just getting smarter and more sophisticated all the time. Why would we go from these really sophisticated AI powered machine learning drones back to something that, I mean, well, to be honest, it actually feels kind of like World War I stuff where guys are studying their maps and then they, they put on their goggles and then they take off and they fly nap of the earth uh, they navigate using visual landmarks and then they hit individual targets inside of trenches. Uh, why are we going back to that when it is the 21st century? And there's a few reasons for it. One is that the human pilots are still capable of things that uh, the autopilots aren't. But the other one is cost and there's some other logistical sides to it as well. If you build a disposable drone, it only has to make one trip. That means that the time that you are in flight, the time that you are controlling the drone and susceptible to electronic warfare, all that gets cut in half if there is no return journey. The batteries get to be smaller if you're flying a lot shorter distance. You get a power to weight ratio that gives you some better speed maneuverability that gets you past countermeasures a little bit better. And then of course, if you were carrying some kind of munition payload on a reusable drone, you need a release mechanism. This adds complexity and weight and so forth. So there are some significant benefits to the disposable drones and you can get the price down to the point where they become really effective. There's not much to this drone outside of the radio and this little camera here. Once you put a battery on it and these four props, you're only a few hundred dollars in. And there are, you know, battlefield applications for FPV drones nowadays. Uh, one reason being because they are disposable. They're not, they're only, it's only a few hundred dollars to build one of these. So you can send one of these into, into no man's land and not, you know, worry about it so much, you know, disposable. Uh, it, and the, the advantage they have is, is being so precise. Uh, it's uh, a unique kind of battlefield advantage, I guess, you, I guess you could say, to use some of these as far as for many dip different applications, maybe recon, maybe uh, search and destroy, something, something along those lines. I'm sure we've all seen the videos lately. What's your range? Like how far could you go distance wise? Uh, well, these setups, uh, maybe about a mile with line of sight. Uh, so you kind of you need a little bit of line of sight. Uh, these aren't, these setups I have here aren't uh, long range setups, but I do have a long range setup, you know, bigger, longer antennas, uh, more powerful antennas, things like that, that we can get out to five to 10 miles uh, with relative line of sight. You know, you can kind of, the signal will penetrate through trees and whatnot, but it's not gonna penetr penetrate to the side of a mountain or something like that. So that's still kind of a, a drawback with with FPV, you still kind of have to be, you don't need to be right on the front line per se, but you still have to be kind of near it, uh, you know, to kind of be able to utilize these in a situation like that. Now, obviously a lot more skill is required in flying these things on the modern battlefield. The smart drones are semi-autonomous or fully autonomous at this point. You can send them places just by clicking on a map. This is a lot more involved, but it's very relatively somewhat easy to learn. It took me maybe uh, a few months in a simulator uh, to kind of get the to get the ball rolling in terms of how, how to fly and you know how to not destroy a drone as soon as you launch it. You know because it is pretty much all manual. Uh, there's no training wheels. There's no return to home on these at least. Uh, so it took me a few months to kind of get going on that. Another few months to kind of uh, learn how to build them and how to configure them. Once I felt like I was proficient flying in the simulator, uh, I took it outside in the real world and started just practicing those same maneuvers that I was using in the simulator. Uh, and then, you know, moved to indoor, you know. So I started doing outdoor drones, 
This is actually the first, first one I flew with. And then uh, shortly after that, started flying inside. And uh, turns out flying inside isn't, isn't as bad as people might think. Uh, you, for one, you don't have to deal with wind inside. Uh, so that's kind of nice. And uh, yeah, so I'd say overall, maybe like six months of kind of intensive learning and training, things like that. Once you have some experience with a decent controller and a decent uh, simulator like liftoff, you have the skills to fly one of these things in a lot of different scenarios. You need to spend a little bit more money on goggles, either the expensive digital DJI goggles or the cheap analog fat sharks or you know, there's a bunch of different competitors out there. Then all you have to do is be able to build and set up drones for your particular mission setup. And that is um, relatively straightforward with 3D printers and off the shelf printed parts and basically really simple digital radio brains. These things are pretty quick to slap together. So we have the ducted setups, which is, you know, what you want to use when you're flying close to people or close to any sort of uh, subject you don't want to hit or damage, right? So these two, uh, you know, and even these are specific uh, to themselves. Like this one is not as good in the wind. I use this one more if it's windy because it'll cut through wind better, so. So I noticed that these ducts here are, you know, slippery smooth injection molded plastic. And what about these ducts? These ducts are 3D printed TPU. So a lot of the parts on these FPV drones are 3D printed. Uh, I print a lot of them myself. And uh, yeah, so all of these are custom built. And uh, this drone here, this is a waterproof setup, waterproof housing. It's enclosed with, uh, again, TPU coming around here. And you know, this can just launch out of the water if you want. So nice. different setups. And you can run them on a bunch of different types of batteries. This here is a standard 18650 lithium ion cell. Uh, these are pretty easy to come by. If you bust open an old laptop uh, battery bank, you will find a couple dozen of these inside. If you bust open a Tesla S, you will find tens of thousands and uh, readily available for you to build out your little drone fleet. Uh, and you can recharge all of this stuff using not that many solar panels because it's pretty energy efficient. So that has been a pretty phenomenal change that we have seen on the battlefield. This moving, not entirely away, but a lot of moving towards much smaller, much simpler, much more um, renewable munitions delivery platforms for people on the front lines on both sides. Let's talk about countermeasures. Uh, the obvious way to stop these things is by shooting them down, but since they go anywhere from like 70 to 130 miles an hour, that's pretty tricky. For reference, 130 miles an hour is about as fast as blaster bolts go in the Star Wars universe, so to knock these things down, you would need Jedi reflexes. It's a stand -off. let's go. And quadcopters are just getting faster all the time. The Red Bull Racing Team commissioned some guys to build an FPV racer that would follow a Formula One car around a complicated track. And really, they had no trouble keeping up at well over 200 miles an hour. That kind of puts an end to the theory that we can just skeet shoot these things out of the sky. There's also jamming. The good news is that these signals controlling the drone are required 100% of the time. These things are not smart enough not to crash if you sever the link between them. But these things can be pretty clever. With frequency hopping radios that cover a large amount of bandwidth, they're actually pretty hard to jam. It is difficult to blanket an entire uh, radio spectrum zone with enough power to actually stop these things. And it interferes with other stuff that your side might be doing. And so uh, it becomes really tricky to actually deal with this threat at the moment. And conventional anti-armor devices like Javelin missiles, uh, it's pretty expensive for them to actually have the capabilities of going up and coming straight down on top of their targets. Uh, for most FPV pilots, that is a capability that they get for free. So it has some very interesting implications for the future of warfare and, you know, the rest of uh, this three-day war that is playing out in Ukraine right now.
Regardless of how things go in that particular conflict, I think that it is clear to see that FPV drones have really won themselves a place in modern and future combat. The sheer availability of some of the parts, um, the renewability of some of this equipment, the availability of all of these different components means that these things are as ubiquitous as a lot of regular consumer off-the-shelf things. And as information comes back from people who are using these things on the front lines, there are improvements. Uh, I'm confident that we will begin to see more sophisticated digital radios that are cheaper and more disposable, but also have wider frequency hopping capability for battlefield applications. 3D printing and laser cutting of uh, carbon fiber stuff is getting simpler and easier for people to do in garages, and all this stuff is gonna benefit this particular application. So, uh, as fascinated as I am by some of the really intelligent drones that we have examined and researched, uh, the capabilities of some of those really sophisticated computer optical processing capabilities, this is the area that has seen some of the most uh, fruitful research and direct application. And it's getting noticed by people all over the world. So I don't have a clear and direct takeaway or a call to action from this particular video. But I do think that it might be worth you spending a few bucks on an FPV drone simulator, just so you have a little bit better idea of what is going on. And when you watch footage of these things in the current or future conflicts of the day, uh, you actually have an understanding of what is going on. And you will think about different applications for this kind of interesting trend that is developing. It's also fun. It's also a fun thing to do. As much as I enjoy making these kinds of videos, they take a little while. If you want more up-to-date drone research and information, you should subscribe to the T-Rex podcast. That is a little bit quicker on the hop to talk about stuff that is in the news. So you can search for that in any of the podcasting places. Uh, I don't think YouTube actually wants me to give specific addresses, but it's pretty Googleable. And then you'll have more up-to-date information on some of the research projects that we are doing. And uh, until we get to the next episode of Drone Wars, which will be talking more about uh, those larger and more complicated military drones, check out the podcast for other observations. And uh, I'll keep you posted on how we are doing in the shop at uh, learning to fly these things ourselves. Right now, it's, it's, not, it's not amazing. I was about to say, I saw some stuff. Uh, I saw some like glass or something. Yeah, we're good. Uh, where are we? Oh, we're over here.